it's interesting procrastination because what it looks like on the outside is not the way it is uh, felt on the inside. Most of us have probably been, you know, in one way or another, either someone outright said it or we thought they were thinking it, that we were lazy or irresponsible or some other um, fairly simplistic, um, fairly simplistic judgment about why we're not getting things done. And a lot of times people equate procrastination with not being motivated. Even the people who are doing it at the moment um, will tend to think, well, if I was really motivated, if I really wanted it, I'd get it done. Because that is the external viewpoint and we've internalized that at some point. So we need to identify what those things are. It's also going to go around here. So Benjamin Franklin said, you might delay, but time will not. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, research has shown that procrastination is often correlated and sometimes it's causal to issues such as depression, anxiety, and you guessed it, ADHD. Obviously it's not causal for ADHD, but it's correlated with it for sure. Procrastination is really defined as the act of delaying and putting off tasks to the last minute or sometimes past the last minute, sometimes just blowing them off entirely and hoping nothing will happen, nothing will go wrong. Um, researchers, I think, tend to define it as a form of self-regulation failure. I think I would agree with that. Characterized by the, an irrational delay of tasks that are likely and known to be likely to create negative consequences. We know that not sending out the water bill is going to result in the water being shut off, right? That actually happened to me um, quite some time ago before I was diagnosed. I had the, the check written. This is a long time ago when I wrote checks. I haven't written a check for a long time. So I had the check written. It was in the envelope. There was a stamp on it. It sat on my desk for like two weeks until they shut the water off. And then I said, oh, I better go, I better go get that. So I, it's not like I didn't see it. I had it right on the corner of my desk, but I just procrastinated with it. Pretty inexplicable uh, until I was diagnosed with ADHD and a whole lot of things that made no sense to me before started to make sense. Um, so I think that's really a, an important point to realize that it is, on the surface at least, it is an irrational delay of tasks that are likely to create negative consequences for us. Um, Joseph Ferrari is a psychology professor uh, in University of Chicago, I believe, DePaul University in Chicago, I guess. Um, and he talks about um, kind of a system, and he has a book, I believe it's called Still Procrastinating, the, the No Regret Guide to Getting It Done, I believe. Um, he talks about various solutions and he also, research-based, says that roughly 20% of the United States population of adults are chronic procrastinators. We all procrastinate once in a while, but 20% of us just have this recurring pattern. Um, it's just a lifestyle for us in some sense. Um, so I think it's really important to know that it's far more than 20% in the ADHD community, I'm sure. Um, Dr. Sarah, who I really follow, she's amazing, um, and, and by the way, if you want to look her up, it's spelled S-I-R-O-I-S. -I um, she found that procrastination could be understood as the primacy of putting short-term mood repair over the long-term pursuit of intended actions. Um, procrastination, as she sees it, as research shows it, her research, um, procrastination is more about the immediate urgency of managing our negative moods than it is getting on with the task, which have, may have longer term positive consequences if we do it, but there's an immediacy to the negative mood that whatever we're trying to do is kind of triggering for us. I know for myself, I can look at writing a blog post and you know, it, on the surface, it doesn't seem like it's an emotional kind of issue, but the fact is when I really introspect, I realize it absolutely is. There are a zillion things I would rather be doing than trying to write a blog post. And writing is not a problem. I kind of like writing actually, but knowing that this writing is gonna go out there, it's going to be evaluated, people are gonna like it or not like it. 
Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of performance anxiety probably tied into it. There's actually a lot of emotions that go into something as simple as writing a blog post. So I think it's really important for us to kind of introspect and see what's really going on at this moment. And I also like to look at precursors. What's going on at this moment and what was going on leading up to this moment of saying, you know what, there's the blog, but I can do it tomorrow. Today I'm going to go to the beach, right? Or for most of us who actually don't want to feel guilty about blowing things off, instead of writing the blog, we'll mow the lawn and wash the dishes and clean out the garage. We'll do all kinds of secondary things which are important, but they're not as important as the thing that's due this afternoon. So there's there's a tendency to do, and, and you may know full well that the blog, someone's waiting for it. Let's just say Ada, for example, is waiting for my blog. They have a deadline of their own, and I know they're not going to be happy with me, but I still end up doing something else. One way you can know that it's avoidance, like I was saying, if, if I'm avoiding thinking about the blog, I'm numbing myself out by washing the dishes, mowing the lawn, and cleaning the garage, the moment it's too late to turn that blog in, I will have zero interest in washing the dishes, mowing the lawn, or cleaning the garage. I was only doing it to avoid thinking about this other task, which I really didn't want to have to do, right? And I didn't want to do it, not because I don't like to write, but because of all the other factors around it, the emotional things that surround it. That's really crucial. And feel free to unmute your mics if you like. I'm happy to have a discussion. Wow, very interesting, everything you said. And you have confirmed I have procrastination. <laughs> It, there was a lot, you know, there were more definitions than I had before when I had procrastination. There's like all the different, uh, you know, levels of them because I would do that. I didn't realize that was procrastination. I thought, oh, I just didn't do it in time where I'd avoid, I'd vo avoid, avoid, and then it's too late because I missed the deadline anyway. So then it's like I'm free. I didn't realize that was also a form, a variation of procrastination. Absolutely. And I, I believe there's two types, two, two general types, a fork in the road, I guess I would call it. There's avoidance procrastination, mm -hmm. kind of what I have. I don't want to do the blog, but I'm going to do something productive because I don't like not feeling productive. So I'll clean the garage instead of writing the blog. And then there's the, what I would call attraction distraction. And that is, hey, I need to write the blog, but you know, I'm going to watch another three episodes of something on Netflix, or I'm going to play with the Xbox. I'm going to do something just pure fun. Uh -huh. I know it's not productive, but if I'm doing that, especially if it's an intense game, then I know I don't have to think about that thing I don't want to do. Uh -huh. It's really a process of numbing ourselves out either way. Uh -huh. But the solutions, if you're attraction distraction, if you're being distracted by things that you're shiny penny things that you're attracted to, that's a very different solution, set of things to think about, as opposed to, okay, you are the kind of person who feels you need to be productive. You're mm -hmm. just not able at this moment to be productive doing that highest and best use of your time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's a concept in real estate called highest and best use. And that is, you know, you've got a piece of property. Do you put a skyscraper on it? Do you put a swimming pool on it? Do you put a, a petting zoo on it? What is the highest and best use? And it's usually yeah. determined by economics. And uh -huh. You know, so whatever it's zoned for. So I believe in our own lives, especially, well, for most things, even, even family things, we want to, is this the highest and best use of my time at this moment? Mm -hmm. um, and if it isn't, maybe I'm procrastinating. Because mm -hmm. if I know that something is more important for me to do and I'm not doing it, that's, you know, it's clue. And Reg, yep. uh, related about what you were saying, I was actually reading that according to a study by a student psych report, 48% of people procrastinate because of, the, of technology because it makes it worse and creates a massive pleasure gap between what you should be doing and what you want to be doing. So right. yeah, maybe technology can help us in different ways, but I think that it's not so help uh, about procrastination because you preferred uh, watch Netflix or maybe do another things and that's the thing well and and absolutely and the world has gotten so much more complex and there are so many things going on I mean 150 years ago you you had your choice of you know going out to plow the back 40 or sitting around 
looking at a candle burn or something, right? There wasn't a lot more for you to be doing. So it makes sense to me. And the people were in a farm environment. It was it's also very social. You had your family and maybe some workers came in, but everybody went out and did it. Everybody came back. You would be the odd person out if you just sat around doing nothing, right? But now we, we a lot of ways we're kind of siloed, right? If you think about someone putting all their things out in Facebook, you say, oh, okay, well, they're being very social. Well, not necessarily. They're putting things out on social, in social media that they, they want people to see in the way they want them to see them. And they, you know, there's a whole other part of them that's usually kind of hidden. Um, and it works in a variety of ways. You know, we, we're obviously familiar with the, the people who make everything sound like it's perfect, right? And don't put any negative stuff. But I've also seen where there's people out there that are consistently complaining about whatever's not going right in their lives. And if you actually knew them, and because I actually do know a couple of people that do that, their lives are pretty good actually, but they're, when they go to social media, that's their default position. They want to commiserate with some people and makes them feel better for whatever reason. But um, so those kind of things, we, we see a skewed view of people one way or the other. And I think to your point, Andre, I think that um, there's lots of options and there's lots of ways to hide. There's lots of ways to you know, make it look like we're doing something that we're not, uh, in that, or, or at least to get away with not doing it for a while. If it's true procrastination though, we'll, it'll catch up to us because the, the part of the definition is for procrastinating on something that will have negative consequences in the future. So what we're doing is every human discounts the future to some degree, which is perfectly reasonable. You don't wanna save all your money for retirement at 70 and get hit by a bus at 50, right? You might as well enjoy your life as you're going forward, but there has to be a balance there and people, people with ADHD especially, but people who procrastinate on their retirement plans, for example, they are highly prioritizing the present moment over the future benefits that they would get, right? So using the retirement example, we shouldn't save every dime. We shouldn't kill ourselves trying to save for our retirement at 65 or 70, but we definitely should be allocating funds for that. We should not be living above our means and, you know, it's a bunch of shoulds in here, but the fact is if we want to live well later in life, we really have to take care of things now, you know, earlier in life. And that's not just money, that's taking care of our health, a whole, whole number of different things. Um, so I think, let's skip forward just a little bit. And, I, and I'm open to questions because I think that actually will make it better because we can talk about your specific instances of procrastination and we can get this exact same lessons and ideas across, but make them real by having, you know, hearing what you're actually going through. So everybody puts off work once in a while. That's just nature. I mean, we just, we all, we all do that sometimes. Chronic pr procrastination that they're talking about though, is when you struggle to finish pretty much any task in multiple areas of your life. A little, little bit like the definition of ADHD, right? It has to impact two areas of your life fairly severely. Um, so if you're a chronic procrastinator, you're probably gonna see that it's impacting multiple areas. Might be work, might be school, might be relationships, you know, anything like that. Um, not planning for retirement, clearly a, a big one. Um, I think we can all say we would rather not retire broke. And if we are not saving anything for the future, you know, there's an obvious disconnect there. That's a procrastination issue. Um, so again, Dr. Seurat, she, she said procrastination is essentially an irrational uh, prioritizing of the present at the expense of the future. So I think that's just really crucial to realize. Um, the outward perception that people have, and this is where a lot of these pejorative labels that we get as people with ADHD, the outward misconception is that it's about laziness that it's about irresponsibility, it's about you know, lack of character. Uh, I'm not saying some of those things don't exist for some people, but that is generally not why we're procrastinating. That is just not why we're doing it. We were doing it again as short-term mood repair. There's something about it that we really don't wanna face. And the problem is, again, like you brought up, Andrea, there's a disconnect between us and the rest of the world 
And so sometimes we can procrastinate and not do something and kind of get away with it for a while because people don't notice. Again, if you were that farmer 150 years ago and you didn't leave the house at 530 in the morning to go plow the field with everybody else, then everybody would notice and you wouldn't be able to procrastinate that very long. But these days, the world's much more complex. We have places to hide and we have a lot more options. So we can actually say, yeah, I don't, write, I don't want to write the blog, but I'm going to clean the garage. I've been meaning to do that for seven years. I might as well do it today, <laughs> right? That kind of thing. So I did talk a little bit. I think it's important to recognize the difference on a practical level. Are we avoiding things or are we attracted to things, right? If, if I want to write the blog and I'm avoiding writing the blog, directly avoiding, I'm going to be doing something else productive, right? I don't want to do the thing, but I know it's important. I'm not lazy. I'm not tired. I, I, so I can't, literally, I can't say I'm going to go to the beach or I'm going to take a nap because that would make me feel like I was lazy. And then I'd have to say, well, maybe they were right. Maybe I'm lazy. But by being busy, by washing the dishes, reorganizing the closet, whatever it is, now I'm able to completely numb myself out to that feeling. I'm not even thinking about the blog because I'm absolutely concentrating hard on reorganizing the closet um, until it's too late to write that blog. Um, so it, in that respect, it's a way to feel productive instead of feeling guilty to avoid the thing. And when we know that, we can actually just slow down. My first coach always told me, slow down and move faster and say, you know what? What's going on here? Why am I reorganizing the closet when Ada is expecting this blog post from me today by four o'clock? What, what's, what's doing that? I know, I know they're going to be disappointed. You know, it'll tarnish the relationship. You know, we have a fairly deep relationship, so I know they won't go away on us, but it won't help things, right? It certainly doesn't look responsible. So if I can get in touch with those feelings, now I can start to rebalance and I can start to say, you know what? I don't really want to write the blog. But I'm going to get in touch with, you know, what Dwayne Gordon, the president of ADA, will think of us if I don't get my side of the, of the bargain done. I, I will know what, um, I think it's Kelly over there, I've forgotten who it is now, but the person who's actually in charge of posting these things. I'm, I'm, by doing it, I won't make her job harder. If I can get, if I can reacquaint myself for why that blog should get written, then I'm more likely to be able to do it. Excuse me. Another thing that happens with us with ADHD is, um, who is it, Ari Tuck, Dr. Ari Tuckman talks about, it's all about finishing, and I really believe that's a big thing. We sometimes have 17 projects open, call them open loops. We have 17 projects open in various states of completion, uh, and we're juggling those things. And first of all, if we're doing 17 things, we're probably not going to do any of them very well, right? If, if you want to do something well, Pick one thing and do it until it's done or until a reasonable state of, of completion or, or reasonable stopping point and then you move on. So, but when we have 17 projects open and I have to write the blog, I have a list of 16 other things that I can pick from. And it's really easy to say, you know what, I think I should rewrite that course or, or I think, you know, I need to get a hold of that person who said they wanted to be an, an instructor for Renify. I think I should call them up right now. So if I have 17 open loops and one of them is the highest priority, it's very easy for me to slip into a lower priority thing, which is more comfortable. I would much rather talk to a new instructor and just basically have a fun conversation as opposed to writing this blog, right? So I think if you're in that situation, get in touch with why was it the number one thing and maybe some of the alternatives to say, you know what? I already have that new instructor on the, on the calendar for two days from now. Why, why do I need to move her forward? Right? I don't need to do that. I just let her come up on the calendar when we already planned on it. And then I can do my blog right now. So it is a little bit like picking ourselves up by a bootstraps. So it is also really good to have an accountability partner somewhere. As I've said in other classes, I have accountability partners all over the place and they don't know they're my accountability partners. Right. I, I write a little blurb about the business and where we're at, and I go have lunch with a friend, once, two friends now that show up for this little meeting that we have once a month. Well, 
they're my accountability partners. They don't know what we're just there to have lunch and, and, you know, share stories and that kind of stuff. Cause we're, we're all three of us in business. Um, but we also each bring forth, you know, something that here's where I'm at and we get a little discussion and then, you know, we go from there. So I've mentioned, you know, health a lot of times I, I want to stay healthy. So I schedule these really long hikes with people that, you know, with my friends and they become my accountability partners because I don't want to be the last person huffing and puffing up the hill. I don't want to hold them up. So I will go do my workouts like I should. Um, so a lot of times we want to get out of this bootstrap kind of thing, picking ourselves up and align ourselves in some kind of social matrix that'll move us in the right direction. Um, and it's not really germane to procrastination, but it's really important for us, for, us, for everybody, but especially with ADHD, to align ourselves with a social matrix, which is going in the direction that we want to go in, right? The example I give is if you came out of alcoholic uh, rehabilitation, you know, you did your 30 or 60 days, whatever it is. If you come back out into the same social matrix, you're going to fall right back into the same issues and stuff. If you retrain or, or retarget your social matrix, you'll do better, which is, you know, going to groups and having a sponsor and all those kind of things. Procrastination and pretty much anything you want to change in your life, it really helps to have accountability partners, whether they know it, that they are or not. The, um, the thing about, you know, going to the beach or watching Netflix or whatever it happens to be, that's the attraction distraction. Part of that remedy is to just, you know, thing that I say to myself all the time is dinner before dessert. You know what? I really do want to watch those three episodes on Netflix, whatever it happens to be, but they'll be there. I can download them anytime. It's not like, you know, I have to be there at a particular time for that. And I say, you know what? I can write this blog. I think the blog will take me 45 minutes. I'll allow myself an hour and 15. When it's, when it's written, I'm not going to wordsmith it over and over and over again. I'm just sending it in at, four, at an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to consider it done. I'm not going to get a perfectionistic about it. Because that's another reason we procrastinate. When we're perfectionist, we're afraid to get started because getting started implies that we could be at it for three weeks, wordsmithing it. And wordsmithing has a cost, you know, half jokingly, but I say, you know, if someone won't do business with Renify because I have a typo in my email, then we're not a good match, right? It, it's okay. They can go away. There's 7 billion people on the planet. They can go away. And, you know, it's okay. It doesn't mean I want to send out sloppy things, but it also means I'm not going to spend, you know, I'm not going to go over that email 10 times just to try and get rid of every typo. I think that's important. Um, who's got some questions here? This is really meant to be an interaction. <laughs> nope. Okay. okay, so for the, uh, that was great. So the one, the avoiding, I think I go back and forth. Sometimes I'm avoiding and then sometimes I'm, well, sometimes I do the other one, more avoiding, but I do do them both. But anyway, so avoiding the cure is to just like be aware of it. Like how do you do the thing you're procrastinating once you, you know you're doing it and we know we're doing it. How do you stop and then do what you're supposed to do? Yeah, we, we talked about with impulsive spending, kind of installing a pause. You know, let's take a moment. Let's think about this before we do it. Maybe that moment's a day. Maybe that moment is going to talk to a significant other. So I would suggest the same thing here. Procrastination is an emotional brain problem. It's part of the emotional mind that's causing this. And as we've talked about, the emotional mind is far more powerful than the rational mind. In fact, the rational mind is probably only there to help the emotional mind get what it wants in a socially acceptable way. Um, and remember, the emotional mind, in a sense, thinks in pictures and the Rational mind thinks in words. So the emotional mind is just instant, right? Pretty much instant from, from our perceptions, at least. Um, the rational mind takes a little while longer to kind of, you know, figure it out, right? And so, and then the rational mind is weaker than the emotional mind anyway, even if it's, if it, even if it comes up with some rational things. So I would say pausing is really good. If I'm avoiding and I find myself again, out cleaning the garage instead of writing the blog, I'm gonna take some time 
and I'm going to think, okay, you know, I've been thinking about doing this for seven years. Why am I out here right now? Why am I doing this, which is like number 16 on my list of 17 things to do? Why am I out here doing that instead of doing the blog, which I thought yesterday was the number one thing? That's why. And that's another thing I should sidetrack, but I plan tomorrow tonight. And I plan it when I'm emotionally far away from it. And if I'm saying tonight, I really need to write that blog, even tomorrow when I really don't want to write the blog, I'm going to kind of reach back and I say, well, my planning self last night, my rational self said that blog needs to get written. And then I will try to be true to that. Um, and that's something that I've built up over a long period of time, but it's, it really works. When I plan the night before and hold myself true to that as much as possible, um, and I really mean as much as possible, we're talking 99%, um, then you begin to believe in yourself as a person who gets things done, and then you have much more power also. So we can revisit that if that didn't quite answer it, um, but Ms. Taj? Um, I had a, a realization, I think, when you had talked about procrastination in the past at one of the other webinars that for me, a lot of it is um, I, I'm trying to produce my own dopamine sometimes to, to get started. There's something definitely uncomfortable about the, the task, but um, I also feel that like not having that dopamine, so to speak, makes it hard to navigate um, to start. And so I noticed that a lot of the tasks that I will procrastinate on, I'll do something um, physical. Like all of a sudden I wanna go off on a walk. I wanna like exercise. I wanna like, you know, run up and down the stairs. Um, and I've learned to sometimes tie that to doing the task if I don't tire myself out, but <laughs> I can then sometimes go back and be better at, at not procrastinating. Yes, I've definitely seen that, and I've seen that in my own life, too. There's a, a principle, and I don't know what they call it now, but 40 years ago when I studied psychology, <laughs> they called it a pattern interrupt. Um, and so, yes, yeah, sometimes we're, we're sometimes we're looping, we're, we're ruminating on something, or we're in a standard pattern where we say, hey, I need to do this, but I don't really want to do it right now. I think I'll do it tomorrow. It's an illusion to think that you'll feel better about doing it tomorrow than today. If anything, you'll feel worse about doing it tomorrow because now you're another day down the, the road with it. Um, but a pattern interrupt would be, okay, I'm not gonna go out and clean the garage because I know that's not what I wanna be doing. I'm in a really hard time starting the blog, but I'm gonna take a walk around the block or I'm gonna do some other lower level task that only takes a minute or two, very short period of time, and then I'm coming back to it. The problem with our avoidance um, other tasks is usually they take time, they take a lot of time. Washing the dishes, maybe not so much, but cleaning the garage could be an all day deal. So they take as long, as, long as, they, as necessary actually, um, because usually the things we're procrastinating on have some kind of deadline. And the deadline may not get you out of it. That's the insidious, irrational part of it. It may just make things worse. I'm quite, quite familiar with the avoidance thing. I, I, um, I once, this is decades ago, but I had $800 worth of three, three traffic tickets that added up to 800 bucks. By the time they threatened to drag me into court, I paid five digits. I paid something like $11,000 to pay off $800 worth of traffic tickets. That's procrastination in, it, you know, in its pure form. I, I knew it was gonna be a problem. I also knew that I could call them up and say, hey, I don't have 800 bucks. So let's make a deal here. I'll give you 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month. I knew I could do that. It was completely irrational to just avoid and avoid and avoid. So, and a lot of times people will do that with the IRS as well. The IRS will make a deal with you, but people somehow would prefer to, and when I say prefer, I don't mean consciously, but they kind of prefer to uh, hide from that kind of stuff. They don't open the letters and stuff. So, but I guess where I was going with that, see, the IRS wants you to call and they will make a deal with you. No matter what situation you're in, you, they will make it, you know, unless it's pure fraud or something, but they, they will make a deal with you to bring those taxes current. State tax and authority is a little different. We, we've talked about that in another class, but the IRS, absolutely, they want you to call.
Any follow up to that, Josh? Did I did I answer? Yeah, I think that that was good. I I think I am like Elizabeth has said. I kind of myself will go back and forth, but I always find it interesting that like um, before work, all of a sudden I'm like um, uh, like cleaning the house, you know. Yet I've been trying to vacuum, you know, the living room like all week and then right before work I'm like oh look I just I take out the trash vacuum and then I'm late so I do find that um doing things like setting alarms multiple ones and carefully using technology has been helpful to redirect myself because I just don't trust myself to do that all the time absolutely you know some of the strategies that we talk about here that I talk about at, at Renify, um, there's risk factors to all of them. But actually, one of the ways that I get short things done that need to be done, and you know, they only take like five minutes or 10 minutes, is I bracket them. And you know, maybe my alarm went off and you know, 10 minutes to go, I've got to be out the door in 10 minutes, so I want to get somewhere on time. And I'm completely ready to go there might be something on my list that, that I can do in three or four minutes. And I will jump in and do that because otherwise I'm putting it off because oh, it's just a small thing. It doesn't matter much. But if I squeeze it in before that, the danger is if I squeeze something in and it takes longer and I literally kind of forget out of sight, out of mind that I needed to leave. And then it's 20 minutes later and I say, oh my gosh, I'm now I'm 10 minutes late. I don't really, that's theoretical for me. I don't really have much time getting places on, much trouble getting places on time. That's not part of my ADHD, um, especially when other people are involved. And if you have the kind of ADHD that I have, um, you, you always get things done when other people are involved. You may not get things done when it's just you, right? So again, that's why I have accountability partners that don't even know they're my accountability partners. You know, with COVID, it's been interrupted, but I, I used to drive down to San Jose. I, I live just north of it, in California, um, for business meetings. And I detest being late, right? I don't want to be stepping over people in the meeting. I don't want to disturb the speaker. I want to be a few minutes before that meeting starts. So I really don't have trouble with that because I have this really intense feeling, probably too intense, of, you know, being the person who disturbs the room. I really don't want to do that. But if you do have time blindness issues, then you know, you've got to work with, like you said, Ms. Taj, um, technology and all those kind of things. Yeah. Okay. So I think a lot of it is fear. You know, a lot of it is, like I mentioned, you know, writing the blog, there's, you know, I'm not just writing for myself. Someone else is going to read it. Someone else is going to evaluate it. It may or may not be on the mark. It might actually have some inconsistencies or some falsehoods, maybe, you know, things that I think there's so much out there that passes for common sense. And believe me, part of my ADHD journey here is to purge as many things that pass for common sense that aren't true as possible. I, I look for them, but they're out there. There's things that we just take and we assume blindly and they aren't correct. So when I'm writing a blog, I'm quite aware that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm saying something. I say, well, how do I actually know that? I haven't seen a study on it. I, you know, I think I know it because everybody believes it, but it's not necessarily true. It's very much true of ADHD, too. So I, I guess a really obvious example of that is people that, say, see some kid in grammar school that never does his homework and is always outside playing. Very easy to say that's a lazy kid. That's an irresponsible kid, whatever it is when in actual fact there's a neurobiological reason for it. But common sense doesn't, doesn't pull that up. Yep, go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, so um, it does seem like, you know, when I, through this call, looking at my procrastination, and every time I do get to the point of the emails or the blog or, you know, being more social, it is that does seem like a real fear, not just my fear about showing up because there can be people that are so mean on the internet or say things or, or stuff like that. So that's a real fear that I, I think everyone who's working on building a business and we all have to go social, 
you know, how do we address that? Because that is probably a big procrastination for a lot of us who are trying to build businesses online. Absolutely. And yeah, that, that's just so true. And it, it's actually, in some sense, even more true for you because you're an artist, right? So you're not only trying to build a business, which takes a lot of soft skills and being out there talking to people and proactive, right? You, you don't have a boss, right? That's, that's a big problem with building your own business is you don't have a boss. I know quite a few people who were really good at making widgets. So they decided to go into business of making widgets themselves because they thought the boss was paid too much or the company was paid too much and they were worth more. Well, being really good at widgets doesn't mean you're really good at all the soft skills it takes to run a business and put one together. Um, and in your case, you're putting out a very personalized product as well. So there's lots of reasons um, for you to maybe have some apprehension surrounding that, right? And it's good to get in touch with those things and realize them. So, Yolaine, you have a long post there and I'm not good at reading at the same time I talk. You wanna just unmute and tell me what you're thinking. Okay, hi. I'll try to um, make it um, quick and easy. Um, I find that uh, quite often uh, when I um, find myself procrastinating, um, at first it, it may be something quite easy to be done, just like what happened yesterday. And, um, but uh, okay, I, I'm starting to procrastinate, um, taking care of, or taking care of uh, emergencies, uh, urgent things to do. And um, as time passes by, in my mind, that very first task that I had to do is slowly becoming something so complex, difficult, huge, and uh, and time passes by, and and it's becoming so huge that I just cannot start the task. And when finally. <laughs> I, sh I, I have to put an end to it because just like today, a broker was waiting for documents to be sent by mail, by email, and, and I had to do it. I, I just had three people on email asking for the documents. And when I, I finally got into it, I thought, oh my God, I should have done it this morning. Why didn't I do I could I couldn't start this morning, but yes. it, it seems that my mind is tricking me, and I, I'm believing that that task is uh, I, I will never be able to do it. You know, sure. But, and and when I I do it, I say, oh my gosh, why I waited so long? I could beat myself. I'm so it happens more than often and I, I, I don't know how to uh, yep. there's a, not to fall in that trap. Sure. Well, there's a lot to unpack in there. <laughs> um, one of the things, and just put this out and, and leave it, but medication helps with that, right? I, I have run Chad success clinics. Um, Chad's a nonprofit in the ADHD field. Um, for over 20 years now, and I've spoken to, at this point, thousands of people with ADHD. I'm amazed how many of them come back and back and back. They like the group, and, and some of those people have been there for more than a decade, and they're always trying some off alternative treatment or whatever, which might be fine, but they're not taking the, the proven methods of, you know, it ha helps a lot of people, not everyone, but mainstream medications combined with behavioral modification in an ADHD friendly living environment, those things have been proven to work. And yet for some reason, you know, a lot of reasons, but there's reasons why they don't do that. I'm not saying that's with you, it's just that's something that brought up. But I, I think part of this is if you think of scales balancing, there's the consequence of not doing this thing right now, 
and the consequences in the future. So it's discounted, it's lighter than it might be. And then there's the weight of whatever else we could be doing and thinking about rather than thinking about that thing that we don't want to do. And in a vacuum, it's just us in our own mind. And there's, you know, we're bootstraps again. So the weight ends up going one direction or the other. And if we're procrastinating, it's going to go onto the side of procrastinating on the relatively easy thing. I, I think we've all had the experience of putting something off over and over and over again, as I did with the $800 tickets that turned into 11,000 or so. When I finally went into court and not, it was voluntary, but if I hadn't done it, they would have dragged me in. So, right? so, so I went in at the last minute that I could and it was incredibly easy. The guy just said, okay, do you have some money? And I said, yeah, I have a little bit. And he says, okay, we want that. And how much can you pay every month? Good enough, go talk to the clerk and get out of here. That was all it took. But if I had done that when it was 800, like you said, it, when it was really easy, then it would have been over and done. So it's not an unusual thing, especially for people with ADHD to procrastinate on something that's relatively easy. Let's take taxes, for example, forget the penalties for a minute. When we don't gather the documents we need for our taxes, and then three years goes by and we say, okay, I'm going to get them all done. Well, you've lost all the papers. You don't know where the papers are. Maybe the employer that you were working with that didn't send or you lost the 1099 is now out of business. You've got all kinds of complicating factors that weren't there three years ago when you could have filed them. So we all have instances where we put something off and it suddenly over a period of time became a much bigger problem than it would have been in the beginning. So I, the only answer I have for that, off the top of my head at least, is accountability partners, embedding ourselves in some kind of a matrix, a social matrix, um, to where those things will get done. I know when I was first diagnosed, I, I didn't have any money, pretty well broke, but I cajoled a really good coach into helping me out, right? And so she worked with me on an extreme sliding scale. And then as I started being able to pay her, I did, because I think that's the right thing to do. Um, but that coach was an outside source that I could tie things to. If we're, if we're doing it completely on our own, it's a little bit like a spacewalker, right? You, you don't have any friction. You don't have anything to push off of, you know, right? You're, you're, mm. you're floating in nothingness and you don't have any way to get going. But if someone was to reach out their hand or you have one of those umbilical cords, then you could pull yourself in with that. So we need something external to us oftentimes in order to make progress. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who was it? Well, I guess and it's not quite analogous, but we, we, we can't solve the problems with only the information we have in our own head because we created the problem in the first place and we're trying to solve it. Um, Einstein said something similar, but it's different. So anyway, I think yeah. having outside people, I, you know, for myself in business, I, I belong to three different business groups specifically because they help me tie my life, you know, tether it so that I'm not completely on my own trying to get these things done. They don't do anything for me literally do things, but they certainly give me good feedback and they tell me when I'm screwing up, which, you know, I consider that ADHD friendly, by the way. A lot of people think it's ADHD friendly to have people around you that say everything is perfect. I consider it ADHD friendly when they don't nag at me, but they are willing to tell me when I'm off the track because I want to be on the track and I, I won't yeah. be on the track if people don't help me, you know, know when I'm off of it. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of yeah. negative yeah. feedback. Yeah, and can I add something? Yeah. First, on you talked about the medication. Okay, I, I'm on medication. Actually, I, I tried uh, four or five of them, okay. and I had to stop because uh, every time there had there was so much um, side effects, yeah. like uh, losing weight, uh, having heart heart um, problem. So yes, and, and finally. I, for the last uh, four months, I'm on a Bifantin, uh, and, and the doctor is uh, increasing the dose uh, one month at a time, <laughs> just to make sure that I don't have a bad side, side effects. Um, I'm supposed to see her next week, and hopefully uh, we will uh, increase the dose. Uh, but uh, it's difficult for me to, 
to uh, to understand if the, the to what point does the medication is uh, is good for me? Is it really helping? Should I continue to increase, or is it just not effective for me? Yeah, that's clearly a, a question for a psychiatrist or a, a neurologist, someone who who is familiar with these things. Um, and I definitely, I did not mean to say medication, you know, cures ADHD. First of all, there's nothing to cure, but it, it doesn't cure ADHD. It doesn't completely stop symptoms. Mm -hmm. it, it's in 80% of cases, it's helpful, especially when combined with um, behavior modification and a living environment that's friendly. Um, but absolutely, a, a diagnosis of ADHD really a serious diagnosis is not just reading the back of a book and taking a 49 question inventory and quote unquote getting it all right. Mm. And also not sitting with a psychiatrist for 10 minutes. It includes a full physical, especially for older people like, like myself, they would not give me Adderall if they didn't know that my heart was in good shape because a strong stimulant could be, could be yeah. fatal, right? So they're not gonna do that. So a no. full physical to rule out things like sleep apnea, which 30% from studies, 30% of the people who think they have ADHD but have not been diagnosed actually may not have ADHD, they have sleep apnea. Now the complicating factor is ADHD causes sleep issues. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of subjectivity to some of this stuff. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, medication doesn't necessarily fix everything. Yeah. My own, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, it's okay, I understand. Is there? Is there a way for me, uh, kind of a uh, a way for me to um, make a self uh, observation to to understand uh, to what point uh, this medication is uh, is good, really helping me? Is yes. I, I don't know what to look for to say. Oh yes, that medication really helped me on that or that issue. I don't know what issue to look for. <laughs> so I, everything is so difficult. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, a psychiatrist would probably ask you, you know, what do your friends think? What does your significant other think? People like that, because we are notoriously poor self-observers oftentimes. And you know, that's not to make anyone paranoid, but the fact is we don't observe ourselves the same way that other people do. Another thing that I did um, and it worked out really well, is I just started keeping a log and I started thinking, okay, today I took my medication at, at you know, 5.30 in the morning when I got up and here's what I got done during the day and kind of treated myself as a science experiment. So, okay, well, it's uh, at that time was, was Ritalin and Ritalin's one of the drugs you can take and not take, you, unlike Wellbutrin, which you have to taper off of, um, but I would not take it. And then I would keep a log for those days as well and the difference in what I actually got done, I got a lot done either way, because I've kind of the hyperactive, I'm always doing something. But on the days I had a medication, it was really obvious. I did what I wanted to do, what I had planned to do. And the days when I didn't take the medication, I was all over the board, right? All over the board. It was one of the issues I had with my, with my spouse at the time. She said, well, you know, you've been gone all day. You've been working all day. What, what, what did you do? I couldn't remember what I had done. I actually had to look into my calendar. Oh yeah, at eight o'clock I talked to this person and you know, I could look in there, but I really didn't know. I was just kind of you know, out of control. The medication brought that into control for me. Um, mm -hmm. But I, wouldn't, I might not have known that if I wasn't keeping a log that said very starkly, your medication days are much better than your other days. Other people can observe us though. I, you know, my, my girlfriend, she lives across the country from me. And within five minutes on the phone, just from the cadence of my voice or something, she can pretty much 95% accuracy tell me if I've had my Adderall today. She can oh, tell wow. based on my voice. So I would, I'd say, well, what do you mean? How do you know that? But other people can tell. Okay. Does that help? I, well, I think, thanks. Yeah. yeah, the log might be a good idea. So, and, and then you can take that log to your psychiatrist or whoever you're talking to and show them that. I'm a fan of coaching. I think coaching is very expensive. So we have to be careful, especially since so many people with ADHD have money issues. But that's 
semi-professional person that hopefully you have a lot of chemistry with that can really kind of, you can relate to once a week or whatever it is that your, your schedule is. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Low on time, but go for it, Elizabeth. I'm not in a hurry. We're good. Yeah, I was going to say um, to, to your your laney, your lawn, your lane. So uh, I'm just real early in my diagnosis, and I had a similar thing. I took the medicine and lost a lot of weight. And uh, but I think one of the questions you're asking is, how do you know if the medicine is working? And just I want to confirm what Rick said. Like suddenly those things which I could never do before I could just do. I might still be having brain chatter about why I shouldn't do this action, but my body does it. It's like somehow it, I can get over a resistance and get more stuff done. But that is scary when you lose that weight. I just came off of that and it, you just have to keep trying. That's what I've heard from everything I've read. You just keep researching everybody. It's, like human body is so unique, something will work for you. And then just knowing some, my therapist I was working with, some people can actually take the medication and learn, like, you know, retrain themselves. But I don't know, it's a journey. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. I, I, I get you when, when you, uh, you're telling about resistance. Okay. Sometime I may feel like uh, I'm resistant and other days uh, it, it comes more easily. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. That, that, mm -hmm. My experience with medication is it lowers that resistance considerably for me. Um, but I would um, I'd also like to point out that medication alone doesn't have nearly the efficacy of medication with behavior modification and a, and a, and a ADHD friendly living environment. Um, and job and you know all that relationship um, what I believe what happens this is not scientific but it is what happens is we live in kind of a, a matrix of things that are pushing and pulling us in all different directions right our our home life our family our work life our personal health is we have all kinds of things going on we have other issues going on besides the ADHD so we have all of that and the medication helps us temporarily move toward the center if we want to be in the center, right? We might be off to the side a little bit and we want to be in a different spot. It helps us move there. But if we don't do the work and learn things, as Elizabeth was saying, if we don't learn things, then our mind wants to be back in that former state of equilibrium. And we're trying to create a new set point here, right? We're trying to say, you know, I don't want to procrastinate anymore. But our old set point was procrastination. So we can kind of white knuckle it through self-discipline and using the medication. But what will happen is our mind much stronger than the medication will bring it it'll overcome we have all those neural pathways it'll overcome and it'll bring us back to where we were before which i believe is why people say medication hey it worked great for three months and now it doesn't work at all right because it didn't do the work to change the, the the balance of things we have to cut ties with the things that are holding us back you know back again back to the alcohol rehab thing you cut ties with those people that invite you to the bar right that's not working for you right so cut ties with them ADHD, we have things like that too. What's it, what do we fall for impulsively? You know, what are we buying? Or how can we stop buying things like that? And then we need to strengthen the things that are pulling us toward where we want to be. That might be friends who are ADHD friendly, meaning they will, in a kindly way, tell us when we're off track. Maybe it's a different job, right? It, all kinds of things. We need. I, I know my social matrix changed dramatically after I was diagnosed because I didn't want to be over there. I wanted to be over here. And the only way to do that was to change the matrix around me. And I don't mean, you know, sci-fi matrix. I'm talking about just all the different components that are surrounding us in our life. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Rick, yeah. when you say uh, social matrix, what's that? Well, by social matrix, I would say who our friends are, uh, you know, a lot okay. about, pardon me? Yes, what, I don't understand that expression, social matrix. Oh, well, I made, I made it up. <laughs> so ah, okay. <laughs> the, social, the social pool that we're swimming in, right? Who, who the people are that we know, what we're doing, what kind of work we're doing. Someone, uh, Ms. Taj actually put in even better, you know, how we sleep and how we take care of ourselves and our health, our nutrition, our activities. There are toxic people in environments. We need to kind of 
minimize those to the extent that we can, the, the toxic parts of it, and then we need to strengthen things. Um, okay. I know for myself, I wasn't in bad shape, but I certainly wasn't in good shape when I was diagnosed. I, I ate a lot of junk food and I, I, you know, I just didn't really take care of myself too much. Um, mm -hmm. Well, now I realize that that's a huge risk factor with ADHD. You know, there's a reason why people with ADHD lose you know, a decade or more of life expectancy, right? And some of that has to do with money, some of it has to do with a lot of other things. So I began eating much better. I began exercising and that alone began to improve my ADHD issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. didn't get rid of them but i guess the way i would look at it adhd is a neurological brain function difference and it can be exacerbated by lack of sleep for example and or poor nutrition and all those things there's there's no such thing as the adhd diet you know someone made a lot of money selling that book but if you, if diet eliminates your adhd you didn't have adhd right but if you have adhd and you have a poor diet those two things compound so you want to have a good diet You'll still have ADHD, but now you at least you have that layer that you don't have to deal with. Okay. And yes, sleep apnea, big issue. Um, a psychiatrist, uh, you walked are in. There, uh, mm -hmm. Excuse no, me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are, are, there, are there any symptoms that I could look for for uh, sleep apnea? Well, I would get, if you have any doubts at all, I would get tested because I'm not a sleep doctor, I don't know how all that works, but I do know that the research, and I wish I had a study to quote, but the research is that roughly 30% of the people who think they have ADHD okay. actually have sleep deprivation issues going on. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, if you're not, if you're, if you're feeling tired all the time, then that's, you know, that might be a clue. That could be diet or it could be sleep. Mm -hmm. I will say- Sorry, it, it's Helen here. If you have a partner who you sleep with, um, they if they hear if they you snore and then all of a sudden there's a big gap, like forty seconds gap, twenty seconds gap in between breaths, that's a good sign that you got. And then people tend to do the <laughs> type breathing afterwards. So sleep apnea is often first observed by partners. And then, you know, it's the sense of, uh, you know, also people t often say, you know, sleep apnea people often say they don't have any trouble getting to sleep because they're so sleep deprived. They, the minute their head hits the pillow, they fall asleep. But, you know, if they're sleeping with people, there's often a, um, at certain parts in their sleep in certain stages, they have big gaps in between breaths. And that's, it's clinically very like risk. It's, it, that sleep apnea alone will take 10, 15 years off your life. Oh. Yeah. And that sounds like really good advice. I hadn't really thought about that, but yes, your, your partner is going to know about those kind of things. Um, I also believe there are wearables now, but that, that can actually keep track of how you're sleeping. Wearable devices. Not, not, I'm not talking about CPAC. I'm talking about an Apple Watch or something. I don't know. So some of those things. Thanks. We're moving into that future where wearables are going to be paying a lot of attention to how our body is doing and our mind for that matter. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry, I, I cannot activate my uh, video. So this is why the, the photo still is there. <laughs> well, you have a great scenery there. That, that actually was really good. Uh, mm -hmm. I was talking to Ned Hollowell, not personally, but he was doing a book signing and, and I kind of quartered him. And I thought this was really amazing coming from a really high level psychiatrist. But he said that the sense of connection and belonging that people get, this, this Frankel would call it search for meaning, that this, this sense of belonging people have in groups like this is worth more than all the medication and therapy put together. And I think he was serious. And I think it was also amazing because that's, you know, he's a psychiatrist and you know, really high level, that's what he does. Um, so, and he's obviously incredibly well versed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's wrap up. See you next time.